Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Hope you all had a nice break. So we are in for a huge treat now. So thanks to technology, we are able to go over to Australia. Um, and uh, Grant of Meredith is going to uh, present. And um, I think it's about one o'clock in the morning where he is. So yes, so uh, he said that he didn't mind when he pr presented. So I've got nothing to do with that. So um, without further ado, please, can you welcome Grant Meredith? Over to you, Grant. Thank you. And um, thank you for actually, actually uh, allowing me to uh, speak. Um, the the, um, the presentation this afternoon is a very small snapshot of a much, much larger study, but I think it ties nicely into the theme of this um, conference when it comes to silence on um, the campus, and especially for um, students who's, who stutter. And the fact that that silence is not actually feeding um, the um, support networks um, that could uh, um, assist um, students who, who uh, stutter. So um, I probably know some people in the um, audience, um, but just for people who, who don't know who I am, I'm not sure why my slides are not working now. Uh, um, I actually am a lecturer of IT. Um, focusing on actually multimedia and um, uh, gaming with um, Federation University of Australia. I also lead a research program called TAPS, um, where we are looking at various um, software platforms for um, the people who, who uh, stutter. And um, I also research uh, stuttering, but more in a sociological sense. Um, so this is just one of a few studies that I've been working on. Um, so at the moment, I'm, I'm actually just about to um, submit my... Um, PhD. And it's actually focused on um, Australian university students who stutter. So basically looking at um, how they negotiate their student life cycle. Um, and it's, it's actually a very, very large study. It, it, it encapsulates um, three different methods. Um, first, there was a web audit of all 39 public Australian U university websites. Uh, this, this study has been actually published um, and basically looking at from a public view, what, what, what information can we find about how any given university could accommodate someone who stutters? So actually looking for mentions of um, stuttering and then some, some um, forms of uh, strategies. What I found was actually very, very little. There, um, from a public perspective, there is very little at all when it came to stuttering that I, that I could access and very few with any um, specific mention of a speech um, this, um, order, um, uh, which was interesting. But um, I, I, I can kind of understand that, um, but I, I won't go into that in, during this presentation. Then I did a survey of 102 Australian university students who stutter. So um, a majority of those students had actually graduated. Um, and again, there was a survey which ranged from, I think it was about uh, 40 questions or so, looking at the complete student life cycle from um, pre-enrolment um, through to graduation. Um, what, one of the big encouraging findings from that was that um, only two student, oh, only two Australian students who had enrolled in the university had actually dropped out the, um, because of their stuttering, and the other ones were either still active students 
but a majority had actually graduated um, and we had moved into jobs that their university degree had had actually trained them for. Um, and um, a surprising result, I think, for, uh, the, for the general public more so possibly is that uh, lots of them were studying topics, for example, like law, medicine, nursing and um, education, um, you know, um, all areas which rely actually fairly heavily on the uh, spoken word uh, still. And then I did more, um, I guess, more um, in-depth um, data gathering of um, 15 Australian um, um, university students who started, I actually interviewed them. Um, and uh, that, that was that, that, that was very, very interesting because those stories expanded more and experiences I could actually speak um, deeper. We do have some considerations here, I think, when it comes to the actual data. So a lot of the data was actually gathered um, nearly 10 um, years, a year, years ago. I'm, I'm only a part-time student and I've actually gone a little bit um, over um, time. Um, so the data is perhaps just a little bit dated. Um, and I also think, and again, this is, this is an area which needs a lot more study actually. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some Australian cultural perspective involved with the um, data also, um, where uh, stereotypically Australians are somewhat self-reliant um, and there's that's kind of, you know, the um, attitude of um, everything will be right, mate. And just basically get um on um with it and um and um get it uh, done. I'll also say that th these are um you know uh, uh, these students to me seemed like a very very confident bunch of students and um they are the the people who were in the survey they chose to participate so possibly there might be a slight um, data data um, um, bias there also because um, they were a very very uh, extremely confident group 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 of um, students. Um, the interesting thing is, which this presentation doesn't focus on much, is a lot of the students used what I would call cons concessional bargaining. And what I mean by that is during their actual student journey, at times they made trade-offs the, uh, the, um, between um, the grades and basically uh, avoiding speaking. So during some forms of um, oral uh, assessments, these somewhat, you know, seemingly confident students were actually uh, uh, avoiding them or not doing as much work as they should to actually get the grade, which they possibly could have, you know, gotten like a much, much higher uh, grade. But they were perfectly aware of that and expressed almost a pretty high level of, of a satisfaction with those choices too, which was, you know, a very interesting finding. So, Today's focus, though, and, and again, um, I could be talking about this topic for hours, um, is looking at the disability liaison units, which sit within Australian universities and probably also over in the UK. And a little bit of um, uh, a discussion about what the students thought of these units and, and how many students actually did access help and then what levels of satisfaction came from that, that help. So in Australia, these units um, are set up to basically accommodate students um, uh, from a wide range of um, um, imp impacts, um, you know, broken legs, um, 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 through to 
uh, you know, very severe um, disabilities, trying to make sure that, you know, these students can still have a, have a, have a fair um, education. Um, they, they're like a middle ground between usually the students and the staff, especially the um, academic uh, staff. And they focus on reasonable accommodations. So it makes sense that if, if a student is training to actually be a nurse, they're going to have to do rounds, you know, in a um, actual hospital. But then it's it's working out what you know what sort sort of accommodations could they do in those rounds um, to possibly make um, um, to possibly not focus so much on their speaking or to make sure that um, everybody knows about that um, that they are stuttering and to make sure that they're still actually marked fairly soon. Um, and. And the negotiations happen then between, say, you know, students and staff and students and this unit and staff and this unit in terms of what the academic is also happy to allow in a sense of uh, strategies. Um, so it's not just that we randomly accept everything, you know, that there still might be a little bit of um, uh, negotiation there depending on, on the um, individual course re, um, requirements too. Now, basically, you know, we have over 100 students that I gathered um, data from. Roughly that only 10% of these students actually accessed help, which was interesting. Um, but again, knowing the, the self-reliant attitude of many people who um, study, you know, personally, um, I can understand why this is. Most of them, um, and th most of them, and these are also the including the people who did not access, simply assumed no help existed there. They did, but they, many of them reflected that when they were going through primary school and through high school, they were offered no help and they saw no help. So they assumed that at a, um, a university, there would also be no help. One of the major parts of my study is the um, rejection of the labelled disability. Um, and a majority of all the students um, surveyed outright re rejected it. Um, they did not see how stuttering was one. Um, in some cases, they were actually ignorant to what um, disability meant. But I think really from an, an identity shift, they simply did not want to align with, with um, that um, term. And again, then less likely to possibly access the disability li liaison units for help too. Most of the, of the, you know, very few students who access help only accessed help in their third and in an Australian context, most likely their final year of studies. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that final the pivotal year. Um, there might be some very, like, in, very important um, assessment tasks, possibly some of these sort of um, oral-based or, or um, very orally focused assessment tasks um, were worth a lot of marks or that they had to be passed, you know, um, to a certain extent. So, and that's when they were actually ac accessing help. There are very limited strategies offered, sometimes by simply um, being part of the team and pressing the next button on a, a PowerPoint slide um, or presenting in a separate room. Um, there was a very limited set of um, strategies offered to these students. But the students did reflect that they were rather satisfied still with um, what what was offered and the re, um, results of. You know, they were still basically getting what they were hoping for. It just wasn't to the extent that they actually hoped for. And, and especially a lot re reflected 
they had no real say. They weren't um, asked them, them, um, them, um, themselves what they actually wanted. And practically most of them said they still wanted to actually talk. Um, but what the very alarming factor here is, of the 10% or so of students who access help, most of them left that process with feelings of confusion, higher feelings of shame, having you know asked for help, having to have having to um to disclose their um stuttering to possibly multiple parties, having to actually prove it, um an embarrassment, and they also indicated a lot of them that they had shifted identities. They actually said. As a result of accessing support, they felt more disabled than they did be, um, be, um, for actually accessing help. Which again is, you know, that's a very interesting finding, but it's something that we definitely don't want to see. Um, well, you don't want confusion, shame, embarrassment, um, um, occurring from a process which is meant to be empowering, you know, confidence building. Um, so that's actually, you know, a surprise finding, but I think it's one of the most important ones, actually. This leads me to what I term a vicious cycle. So we've got very few students who start up accessing help at um, the unis, at least in Australia. Um, the disability liaison units as a result, possibly, you know, um, have have are expressing limited strategies for for such students. I actually contacted all thirty nine universities, um, spoke to the disability liaison units, and the ones who answered me, basically none had ever seen a student who uh, stutters. Um, present for help, um, which leads in terms, you know, students who start out being more possibly deterred um, from seeking even more help, you know, they're, they're some, somewhat satisfied with it, but again, it's not empowering. They indicated that the disability staff were actually nice and they were friendly and they were giving them time to actually talk and answer but they weren't actually really listening to them or not wanting to hear what they actually wanted. Um, again, then, as a result, disability liaison units are exposed even less to um, students who are stutter, and they have, again, limited strategies. And it just keeps going around and around in a circle at the moment. So I think our job in the future is to try to, is to, try to break this cycle in some, some fashion. Just some thoughts, sorry, because, you know, I haven't got a lot of time to uh, talk. Um, so we have to try to encourage these students to actually consider accessing help if it's required um, from pre-enrolment onwards because uh, uh, most of the students, a large majority, were saying they were not even looking for help pre-enrolment. Um, it was not even in their, in their mind, not a single thought there. We also need like stuttering organisations to be proactive themselves. So we need to be sending information to unis, to be doing presentations at unis, to be more involved, to make sure the universities know we know this is a serious thing. And stuttering and the impact of stuttering on the individuals, on the individual at times can be actually fairly marked. And it's not, you know, a, a consistent um, impact either. And again, you know, leading to services like uh, Stuck um, and some other, you know, like um, web um, sites, etc. We also possibly need to think how we positively frame disability with, with in our own ranks too. So stop seeing it as a negative, understand some of the legal um, the definitions of it, and um, 
start to align slightly to it because if we align to disability, there's large disability worldwide organisations, some of them very, very powerful, very, very strong, who can all also assist. Um, and stop thinking of disability models as being only two, like the social model and the medical model, because there are other models out there which um, organisations or individuals can actually accept. One such model is called the affirmation model, which really focuses on the individual, making them aware that their differences are valuable to themselves and to the greater uh, society also. Um, so I think this is just some ways of starting to actually change their things. Um, but I think um, especially conferences like this are key, but we've got to get the messages, messages out beyond even these um, conference walls too. Um, and that's my presentation, thank you. I think I've finished on time. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can, I guess there's some question time and um, you're quite welcome to email me, me also. Thank you. Is anybody there? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hey, yeah. Lindsay. Yep, yeah, they're coming your way. <laughs> Hi, Grant. It's Lindsay Pike here from the University of Bristol. Um, really, really interesting findings and really depressing as well. I was really sad <laughs> to hear that um, help left students feeling worse than <laughs> than before um but, but i really like the idea of the the affirmation model rather than just thinking about it in medical and social model terms and wondered what you think could be done in universities to promote that and what the best ways in might be um and whether there were any insights from speaking to students about who might have been able to to offer help that was more positive and uh, and useful for them. Oh, uh, yes. Well, um, one interesting interesting thing from these students was was Lindsay that no disability liaison staff accessed um, any form of um, guidance from a speech um, therapist or a um, stuttering organisation. Um, so again, that, that's that's a knowledge um, gap um, area. I think um, it's 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 a difficult one when it comes to disability, and I think language has to change a lot, and the way that even these units actually frame them themselves, because it's more about um, it's more about in inclusion um, than simply not, you know having that um, D word in a title and actually seems seems to be a be a be a blocker. Um, but Lindsay, it, it, it's, it was incredibly interesting and um I've got to write a um a paper on it. The um the attitudes from the students who started about what the disability actually meant. And they were definitely uh separating themselves from the stereotypical view. Um, for, a, for example, one student basically says, look, I can walk, um, I can hear, and I can see. I am not dis disabled. Um, so I, I think it's a hard job, but I, I think it has to start at a organisational level, um, especially amongst um, stuttering organisations too. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Hello, uh, Grant, this is Barry Hayward. I work at King's in the disability support team. And um, oh, yeah, that finding uh, struck me. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, I speculate as well, maybe part of the, um, how we offer support to people 
could be part of the picture. Mm. I, I recognise what you say about people have a view mm. of what disability means and whether it, it mm. fits with them. But um, Abed, who was speaking before, said he was asked for evidence. And um, mm -hmm. I yes. spoke to a student recently who didn't have any evidence. But um, I, I think universities have to look at that strongly about mm. requiring medical um, affirmation of something. So um, it, it goes back to, we used to sort of still do a bit, but we used to throw a lot of resources that cost money at students. And I think it was perfectly reasonable to make sure that there was proof of uh, a disability to allocate, you know, yes. taxpayers money. But when we're talking about what we are in this area of letting lecturers know what they should do, perhaps producing a document that describes what um, adjustments mm. might be required. I don't see that we need to ask people to prove they have a disability. So I, I yeah, and I, I wonder if that might be part of this uh, feeling of stigmatization that it seems has come through mm. by people seeking support. So um, that's something I'll, I'll certainly take back into the sector here. Oh, thank you, Barry. Um, um, uh, um, Barry, what, what, what I'll say is all 10 students who, who basically asked for help were asked to, to um, approve their stuttering by actually seeing a doctor. And they were actually con um, con um, fused why? You know, how, how, how does a doctor know um, that I stutter or um, not? And then, then they said that the doctors that they saw were, were, were also kind of refused too. <laughs> but every single doctor signed it. <laughs> um, but again, it's an, it's an extra step. They've taken a brave step to ask for help. Then they're told they've got to actually prove it. So they've got to go to, um, to some, some, somewhere else, um, say, yes, I'm a person who I studies. Can you please sign this? then go back and see another person. You know, it's maybe three or four steps there. No? Okay. Well, Grant, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. And please go and get some sleep. <laughs> thank, you, Claire. Thank, you. thank you very much. Can you please show our appreciation? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So can you please welcome our next speaker, Dr. Claire Tupling. Hello. Okay. Just give me a second while I um, remind myself what I'm talking about her day and hopefully click the right button, which would uh, help. Okay, okay. Uh, there we go. So, um, for those of you that don't know me, that's who I am. I'm uh, Claire, Claire, T Claire Tupling. Um, I'm a sociologist by trade, and I'm a senior lecturer um, in education at the college in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Education at the U University of Derby. Um, as a lecturer, um, you can imagine that I do quite a lot of talking in my work, so a lot of teaching, a lot of presentations, um, supervising the doctoral students. Um, anyone who works in academia will know you have to go to lots of meetings, um, some of which can be exciting. Um, <laughs> And there's also making phone calls. I work with a lot of part-time students, a lot of students that don't come onto campus. So the only way that you can communicate with them is uh, by Skype or telephone calls. So there's quite a lot of speaking that I do in my job, and um, I also have a st st stammer. Um, um, so as well as kind of spending most of the day talking, um, there are some of the other more mundane activities like admin that don't involve a lot 
not speaking, but it's actually the speaking part of my job that I enjoy the most. I don't know many academics that enjoy the uh, paperwork, but perhaps there are some. Uh, so just by way of orientating ourselves to what I'm going to talk about in this presentation, I'll just say briefly, this is a kind of a navigation, a guide to what I'm talking about, so you know what to expect. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and my research and where, where that research came from, that additional labour of uh, academics who stammer. Um, then I'm going to go on to link to our conference theme and consider what we mean by uh, silence on c campus. Um, and I will consider then, as a part of that, the reasons uh, and the consequences for declaring yourself as to be a disabled ac academic or an academic with, uh, with a disability. I'm then, then going to look at some initial findings from my research that's ongoing um, about the experiences of academics who start, including my own experiences, how that fits in as well. Um, and finally, actually, this presentation is going to serve as a recruiting platform if anybody wants to um, volunteer to be part of my research. Um, and they can, I've got my contact details at the end, or you can just speak to me. So, this is a research study that I'm currently involved in. So, it's experiences of managing fluency and disfluency amongst higher education lecturers who stammer. That term lecture is quite broad because there are some lecturers that don't do a lot of teaching, even though they're called a lecturer. Uh, there's researchers and there's also a PhD students who might do a bit of teaching as part of their studies. Um, so this research didn't just come out of nowhere. I didn't just wake up one morning and think, oh, this would be interesting to research. Um, so it's been shaped by my own experiences of uh, being a lecturer who, lecturer who stammers and who's had to navigate some of the challenges in that workplace um, as a consequence so briefly about myself, I've been teaching since 2004, which seems like a lifetime ago. Um, in, so mainly in social sciences and education. So these are uh, disciplines that require a lot of dis discussion. Um, I hope I've been doing that job successfully. Um, I probably wouldn't still be in it if I wasn't that su su successful. My stammer has been an ever present during this time. It's caused me um, to kind of question my ability or suitability for the job or whether I'd be accepted in the job. It's caused me anxiety about you know, whether I can maintain the speaking responsibilities that I've got. Um, but even though it's been ever present, it's never really prevented me from doing the job. I've been doing it since 2004. Um, I found that mostly students don't care. Um, and if they do care initially, if they are bothered about it initially, that worry soon wear, wears off. Um, but there's, but there's, there's still that ang anxiety. So I, I feel as though I have to sound good, I have to sound right in order to make good, a good impression. And we know from research studies that students report that... Um, a presentation that is more fluent, they rate that as better than a presentation that um, contains some non-fluencies or disfluencies, even though the content being, that is being presented is the same. Um, I'm expected to go to meetings and be articulate. I'm expected to make phone calls and have those or, other oral communications. Um, so there is this, am I performing well enough? Are, you know, am I satisfying my students? Because that's a big concern in higher education. Is, are students getting what they're paying for? Um, in my current role, things have changed quite considerably in the last few years. Um, and I think that has come mainly because I, instead of retreating from my stomach and kind of hiding it and not really talking about it, um, I've accepted that it's there and I've had to do something to kind of make life a little bit easier for me in my role. Um, 
so as a sociologist, I'm trained to kind of think beyond myself and look at the sort of wider social co context and um, to find some kind of conceptual and theoretical um, approaches to understanding my experiences and those of other academics who, who, who stammer. And in the course of becoming more interested in um, the experience of somebody who stammers in higher education as a lecturer, um, it turns out there are, there are other academics who, who stammer. We've heard from some of them today. And there's, a, there's at least two of us in my, my college. Um, so the title of the conference then is Silence on C C C Campus. And Claire invited us to make a noise about stammering. Um, so I'm just going to go through some thoughts about what we, what we might mean by silence on campus. And these aren't, this isn't a definitive um, um, understanding. It's just some things that you know, I think are quite interesting to think about. So uh, writers like St. Pierre and there's Chris Eagle talk about how stammering uh, disfluency has been largely absent from dis disability studies. And they are making attempts to kind of relocate stammering within disability studies. Now, um, disability studies fits within the social sciences and the, and the humanities, and it offers a way of understanding um, the way that disability is socially constructed. Um, so regardless of whether one thinks of stammering as a disability, the um, approach is a perspective of disability studies offers a way of un understanding st stammering. So it's been silenced because actually academia has not really talked about, about, about stammering. Um, studies with people that stammer has shown that disfluency has the greatest impact in the workplace. And similarly, um, uh, Klein, and Ho Klein and Hood's research um, showed that um, people at the Stammer felt that their disfluency negatively impacted on their job, their job performance. So why would you want to talk about it if you think that uh, stammering is a di is, is is a deficiency. So if you don't talk about it, you're silencing, you're silencing st st stammering. And Claire Butler's work um, has shown that um, in workplaces that there is an expectation to sound right. So why declare yourself to be a st somebody who st stammers? Um, you wouldn't want to talk about it. So this is about silence. This is how stammering becomes silent on campus. Um, however, we also know from other research, so um, John Horton and Faith Tucker um, looked at uh, disabled academics in, in geography. And they suggest that the academic workplace is, is frequently a place that constructs somebody's disablement. So it's a very significant context if you're, if you're in academia. And so their participants felt um, that they became defined by their disability and that they were excluded uh, uh, by their disability. Particular, you know, it, it had impacts for their teaching, it had impacts for their research and had impacts on their career development. At the same time, um, Academic, uh, disabled academic members of staff often declared themselves to be disabled as a kind of an activist position, um, which isn't as straightforward. So we, we could do that. Disabled ac academics could do that. Um, so there is this theory, uh, Giddens, um, it's very simply put, I'm not going to go into it in any great detail, we haven't got the time and uh, so on. So uh, there's this idea that we construct our own identity. We're active in, in choosing um, who we are, our, our identities. Um, and so 
therefore, the identifying as a disabled academic may be uh, a choice, and it may be an assertive choice, and that you, you might be making um, a statement of solidarity or making an assertion of a right to be treated in a particular way or the right not to be di discriminated. But it can also be risky. Um, and it, there's some research that I did, a paper that I wrote with my colleague Deb Althwaite where I talk about um, how I came to declare myself as, a, as, a, as an academic with a, a disability. Um, and this was in quite difficult circumstances, which I aren't going to go into. Um, so there was a choice there. I chose to do it. It was a statement. It was kind of an assertive move to make. But the circumstances had, had uh, kind of forced me into that position. And it was also, in some ways, even that you know, everybody knew that I stammered. I couldn't hide it. I'm not capable of, of uh, hiding it. So that choice isn't always uh, uh, there. So if, I, if we turn to um, some of the experiences of um, academics that I spoke to that stammer, I've described them as accidental ac academics. I don't think this is unique to people that's, that stammer. I think it's common in higher education that people come into higher education when they didn't plan to, through changes of circumstances. Um, but I think some of the ways that people who stammer talk about their role in academia, it's almost as if they're waiting to be found out. They're, then it's, it's um, they're a little bit uncomfortable there. Um, so some of the people I've spoken to talked about how they um, had self-imposed career limitations. Um, so opting to do a job or follow a degree course that involved no speaking, but then finding themselves in academia in academia and then realizing that they did have skills in communication um, um, and how then the stammering became less of an issue or it became less disabling there's also those uh, people that stammer that once in academia decided that's where they wanted to stay just in in lecturing roles that didn't want to pursue uh, leadership roles because they felt there'd be too much um, they wouldn't be capable or they wouldn't be taken seriously in a leadership role or a management role because of their stammer um, and there's also the additional labor that is quite interesting so one lecturer talked to me about how in addition to the lectures that they would produce, they wrote a transcript of every lecture that they did and made that available to students. And they did that, not because they were asked to, but because they felt that if they didn't, they would be disadvantaging the student. And I, no other lecturer was expected to do that. Um, so it was the extra work, you know, instead of, um, just given an uh, oral presentation, they would also write a paper to accompany that. In terms of my own experiences of additional labour, it was the extra time and effort that I had to make to arrange tutorials um, by Skype or to make phone calls. It meant that I was having to book rooms that were empty or somewhere that was quiet where I could go and make phone calls and have these Skype conversations and it just became unsustainable because you'd have to wait three weeks before a room became available in in, in academia everybody's booking rooms there just isn't enough space um so since i came out in as as a um as as a academic who who stammers and was disabled and um um keen to find a way of getting through it. Um, things have changed for me, and I've called this slide train your chair. It could be tame your, your uh, chair. So this is kind of really relates to my own experiences of how I've managed to kind of change my uh, s 
circumstances at work. Um, so one of my challenges was talk, is talking at meetings. Now, some of the more formal meetings, very perversely, are easier to access because they're bigger. It's a university-wide committee. Um, there's very, it's very procedural. The space is where you are expected. The places on the agenda where you are expected to speak. And so you stick your hand up to the chair, and that's a very effective way of managing it. Some of the more, some of the less formal meetings are actually more difficult for me to access because people just chipped in. So I now manage that by um, telling the chair in advance where I want to contribute to, and he then has the responsibility of inviting me in to speak. It means I have to do extra work because I have to read all the papers, you know, a week or two in advance and prepare my response. But what it does is. is demonstrate my ability and it allows me to um, effectively contribute in a way that I wasn't doing that I wasn't doing before so it actually demonstrates uh, so it isn't just the university being kind it isn't just my boss being being kind I've actually demonstrated that those strategies work and because I'm contributing more um, I'm challenging that superiority of fluency. It's very common for me to go to a meeting and stammer. I can't say my name fluently at introductions, and now everybody else, I think, is, is now kind of um, content with that. So I think as, as academics at stammer, I think we have a responsibility to assert your right to, to, to stammer. And my final uh, point is... Um, this research is uh, ongoing. Um, uh, I would welcome any other ac academics, whether they be lecturers, PhD students, uh, researchers, etc., who would be willing to be interviewed as a part of this research. Um, and those, that's my e e email address. Thank you. pages of references if you're really geeky and you want to know them. So. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. Um, I wondered if you'd come across any students who stammer in your work and how you manage that, if you have? Yeah. Um, none of the students that have stammered have um i've not been direct well, yeah hmm. let, me, let me start again <laughs> um i have known students that's that stammer and um um they've not declared that as a disability so that point that grant was making i think sometimes colleagues other colleagues have tried to intervene to support them and not exactly in a very help helpful way so they've assumed that they stammer because they're nervous and um when i've tried to offer the suggestion that they contact the bsa or or um you know that kind of advice it's been met with dismissal that we know the student uh, we know it's about nerves and confidence um yeah no, yeah so i, th I think also, I think um, I think there's an un un unwillingness or a reluctance of, stu of students to, who stammer to declare that and to ask for help, and that could be because they don't know that the help is available. I do know a colleague that is working with a um, student that stammers at the m moment who was on a work placement, and um, she's kind of struggling. Um, with whether she's made the right career choice and my colleague is um discussing the kind she's using me as an example of the kind of strategies that can that that she could think of thank you
Hi, Claire. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. And, uh, yeah, so I've heard of one academic in particular who, uh, who whose job was to deliver a lecture, but rather than delivering a lecture, he changed the format of his whole course and turned it into um, seminars in, instead. So that's an example I've, uh, I've seen personally as well, how it can impact people. Um, but, but my question was, my, now my phone has gone off, um, how much of the imitations you described are self-imposed and how much of it is in response to seeing how other people with disabilities are treated within academia? Because I've seen and heard from people that it's more of a response in, in terms of seeing how badly treated a disability can sometimes be in academia because it's a high pressure environment and there's um, yeah a lot of pressure to perform essentially thank you yeah i mean i would i recognize that those self-imposed limitations so some people i've spoken to talk about that they chose to restrict their career and um yeah i if i'm being honest that was that was my experience i think it changed when I started um, saying what my needs were. In terms of, um, and being quite persistent about that, but also demonstrating that those changes did make a, di a difference. So I got moved from a very loud office, I was working in a very loud office, it, it was almost impossible for me to use the phone um, to arrange those Skype tutorials with students, but since I was moved to quieter to office, that's completely changed. So it's kind of, I've demonstrated that those adjustments have worked and become much more more effective. The other reason was because, as you say, recognizing that employers, although they don't actively set out to di discriminate, that there is unintentional unintentional discrimination so it's an act of sol solidarity and I'm I've now become the college disability coordinator as a consequence Claire Tupling everyone um, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Deborah Johnston So thank you very much. I've got the advantage of coming at this stage in the day because quite a lot of the background and context that I wanted to set has been set by our earlier speakers. So I guess I want to touch on that and just to kind of um, highlight the key elements that we've talked about that I think are really relevant. And then I want to come on to the reason that I think all of the things we've talked about all of the things we've talked about are even more important for us to tackle and to think through now than they were in the past. And that's, that's this point of the rapidly changing context, which is in my title. Um, because the, the, the university systems we're looking at now are quite different to the ones that we were looking at uh, 10 or 20 years ago. So very wordy slide. You can see who the sociologists are in the room and who the economists are. So, so sorry. And at least there isn't data up there or graphs, right? Um, but I'll just talk through it. And actually, as I said, I can touch on some of these things really quickly. So on the, the left-hand side of this um, PowerPoint, what I really wanted to pull out is some of the... Um, ways that um, people who stammer might find their experience at university is affected by the fact that they have a stammer. And it's crucially the things that we've talked about, um, you know, the, the kind of issues um, around the choice of programme and module and, um, and ways that people might act in class. So um, perhaps withdrawing, perhaps being more silent, or perhaps if they're able to, and this is from BSA literature, so you know, excellent BSA resources on this, perhaps actually um, trying to make their point avoiding stammering, but doing so in such a way that it becomes hard to follow. And those of us that stammer will you know, recognise that as something that we, you know, you know, that we might engage in. Um, 
At the top on the left, I put some things that came out of a focus group that we held here at SOAS last year. And it was a focus group that was held um, through our partnership with Stuck. And what was really interesting is um, students here at SOAS talked about all of those things, but they also talked about something that, you know, I, that I hadn't thought about, that hadn't been at the forefront of my mind, but should have been. And it was precisely around those social interactions. So perhaps being away from home or having to get to know lots of new people in the first couple of weeks. And, you know, those social activities, either things that were happening around the programme or the module, you know those awful meetings where you have to introduce yourself, you all go around the room, and we heard um, um, Abed give an example of that, or even in social groups outside of the classroom where um, there was particular stress around having that social interaction and how would you be dealt with, how would people react to you. Um, and, and I think it's important to add the social dimension to the academic one that we've been talking about. People's experiences in universities don't come separately packaged, they're kind of integrated together. And if we don't feel we belong, or we feel that we're disadvantaged in one sphere, it affects the other sphere. Um, on the right hand side, I thought though, and this is the bit I guess is the more controversial bit, and, and I am using that social model of disability, is that if we think about what we've been talking about, we've been talking a lot about the perceptions of people who stammer. But of course, when we're in a setting, like in a social setting, we're talking about that interaction between someone who stammers and possibly someone who is, who is a non-stammerer. And how does that work? And we, we know about the range of studies which you know, say that um, stammering, um, stammering affected speech can lead to you know, um, uncomfortable or unpleasant feelings in non-stammerers. And there's a very wide range of studies. And I think importantly for us, there are a lot of studies in universities among college students, mostly in North America. And I guess that's because college students are a nice captive audience for, um, for researchers to do this kind of work on. And I'm giving this because I think it's really important as the context for what we're talking about. You know, we're talking um, about clear evidence. And I particularly, I'd, I'd encourage people, if you are able to, to look at the Boyle Blood and Blood study from 2009, which is, you know, a recent uh, piece of work looking at the perceptions of um, non-stammering college students in North America of um, speech that is punctuated by stammering. And the interesting thing there, the important thing there, is that there was clear evidence of um, greater perceptions of wanting to socially distance themselves from people that displayed stammering speech, and also having negative connotations of people that stammered. Um, and that was true. Um, in that was true across the piece. Uh, those those perceptions were changed somewhat when groups were presented with different stories about why people stammered. And so this particular research group um, uh, um, conveyed information to each of the um, to to each of the groups that they um, did this this work with, and where people were told that stammering had psychological uh, causes, there were greater negative perceptions than um, the groups that were told that the causes were unknown or that the causes were genetic. And that's interesting. It shows you that the things that non-stammerers bring with them into interactions with stammerers do affect the way that they perceive stammering. So I think it's really important we think about the context. How well educated is the general public? How well educated is the student body? And the reason that I think that's important is that we're talking about university systems that are um, requiring students to interact more than ever. So quite a lot we've been talking about how the, the lecturer interacts with a, um, with a student who stammers. But I think we have to consider also, how do other students interact with a student who stammers? And that's because of a range of factors that have, that have meant that um, a, a wider range of programs than ever before are, are using group-based teaching or group participation for um, you know, key parts of their teaching. And I wanted to talk about why that was, and I wanted to set the scene, because I think it is um, a scene that is more challenging for us and really talks into the things that Grant was talking about, about the relationship between students and um, disability support officers. 
Um, and so I think if we go back to that big context, one of the things that I want to, us to all be thinking about is that greater stress faced by, by students in universities now. And that's something that we have a really wide range of evidence about. Part of that stress is greater financial stress. We know that um, most students are taking out student loans to cover fees that are substantially higher than they were you know, back in 2010, 2011. Um, there's also been changes to the framework for um, accessing the disabled student's allowance. So even if a student wants to access that, it's become more difficult to access funds for particularly non-medical interventions. And importantly, and this is something that opens up new opportunities for us. That's because universities are themselves now charged with being more inclusive right from the start. And so um, the whole aim of that change in the disabled students allowance has, has, has been done partly with the intention of saying, in fact, university teaching must be inclusive right from the start. So people that have disabilities um, shouldn't have to ask for reasonable adjustments. So adjustments that are made after the fact almost, but should be able to actually access teaching and learning in a more accessible way. Um, so the uh, very clear sets of guidelines to universities that they must teach in an inclusive way. And that inclusive teaching approach is often geared around um, meeting the needs of um, students with specific learning differences. So dyslexia, dyscalculus, discal discal other um, other kinds of disorders within the specific um, uh, learning di disability spectrum. And if you can read it, if you've got really good eyesight, I've listed what the expert group says that these are. And these are, um, and just, to, and I'll read through them quickly. I mean, and these are all things that sound great and are great, are genuinely great, but they do provide challenges for us. So um, the first thing is a requirement that um, university lecturers and universities put all of the materials for a course in somewhere that's accessible so that the material can be accessed by students in a much more in a in a in, a, in an easy way the second um, um, requirement is that um, that accessibility um, you know is um, is much wider so most universities now will put information up electronically so rather than having to wait and go to the lecture and get that printed lecture handout, most students now should be able to get their material online and read it and have sight of it before the lecture. Um, to ensure that reading lists are focused and up to date so that particularly people that might have difficulties covering large amounts of reading are not having to do so much um, and that you know people really think about why they're getting students to engage in work. Um, to facilitate the recording of teaching so that students can replay and hear again, I mean you know, all really excellent stuff. Um, to use plain English and clear presentation in class so that you get your message across. Um, to pre-select diverse learning groups, to make sure that learning groups have got uh, positive dynamics with, you know, uh, where you've thought about how students interact with each other. Um, to diversify the range of learning opportunities so that we don't just have that traditional large lecture. So someone up here, lots of people out there, and just being talked at, that there are lots of other ways that we seek to engage in teaching and in learning activities. Um, to think of students as learning partners, people that are there with us on a journey in learning, to ask them what they think about teaching, to ask them what they think about learning, to get that feedback. Um, and then finally, to um, embed inclusive practice all the way through, so that the people up here the lecturers, the support staff are, um, are more diverse um, as, a, as a positive indicator. All of this sounds fabulous, and it is, it, it is, but I wanted to pick out some of the bits that are more challenging, I think, for people who stammer. And that's because in all this sort of, you know, in all of this story, some key approaches have come out that can be more challenging. And particularly in the light of the data that I just gave you, about the difficulty of managing the perceptions of um, non-stammering, uh, of non-stammerers. Um, and that's because when you look at what's happening across a range of programmes, it is very much about the use of um, group-based learning, so participation within a group, or perhaps participation in class, you know, how much does someone ask questions, how much do they attend tutorials, um, or, or um, assess presentations. Um, and there are lots of clear pedagogical 
rationales for that switch and for that change over time. And it's not happening in every programme, but it's happening in many. But um, in the context in which um, people who stammer may not feel confident in asking for adjustments, might not feel confident in expressing what their rights are, they can often come, they can often come into those contexts and be negatively affected. And I wanted to think through some of the ways that you know, that might happen. And might happen in a way that's particularly sort of building up some of the concerns that we started off the lecture with, you know. Um, so um, if you're assessed on participation in class, but you feel that you can't ask questions, then you could find that you have lower marks. If you don't feel that you, you come to tutorials, but a percentage of your mark comes from attending tutorials, you might have lower marks. If, you, if there is a piece of group-based work, but you find it hard to interact with others in your group, you might have lower marks. If you are a, a doing an assess presentation and um, the lecturer mistakes your disfluency for lack of knowledge or for lack of certainty, you might have lower marks. So I just want to make this really clear. It's a real concern that I have that a range of initiatives that have often at their basis, you know, that idea of let's change up teaching, let's make it innovative, let's make it diverse, let's interact with people in different ways, all really good. Um, you know, we talked about that earlier, you know, the kind of positive things about going around a large group and all introducing yourself and changing it so it's not just the person at the front talking. It's all done with really good intentions, but can lead to situations that are disadvantaging for people who stammer. Um, and as I said, these sorts of techniques have come in because of um, a desire to be more inclusive and because it seems to be talking to the needs of a, of a range of people that might have p particular kinds of disabilities, specific learning differences. Um, it's also true that these sorts of approaches are often used if you've got a skills-based approach. So you know, if you're wanting to help students develop workplace relevant skills, and they'll be in a workplace that's group-based or that involves oral presentation. That's another reason why lecturers are using these sorts of techniques in the classroom. And, I'd, and to, to be perhaps you know, more focused on the finances, I can also see that you know, using bigger groups, using group-based work is something that might get driven by cost-saving measures as well. Much cheaper to mark 10 group assignments than 60 individual assessments. So there are lots of factors that are leading to this kind of approach in teaching and learning. But as I said, can lead to disadvantages for people who, who stammer. Um, there's I'm also, sorry, I'm afraid sorry? I don't have an answer to that. Oops. <laughs> Nobody has got an answer, even Siri, even Siri. Um, but, but, but actually we have got some ideas about answers. You see, I segued really well. Um, and um, there are lots of potential mitigations. Now, we've talked a lot about this, and I think all that my slide does is perhaps organise things we've already talked about in a different way. Um, this particular slide came out of two different exercises that we did. So when we did that focus group with people who stammer at SOAS last year, we also talked to students about what helped them, what was positive in class, what was supportive in class. Um, and we had our SOAS learning and teaching conference last summer, and we spoke to, you know, um, to um, learning and teaching experts, to academic colleagues about, about what um, approaches they could use. To, to ensure that people that had a stammer, people that had other kinds of communication disorders um, weren't disadvantaged. And so this slide is something of a summary of lots of individual ideas that have come from those activities, but you know, really talks to things that we've already raised. I think, um, importantly, are some things that go right across this. And it is something that perhaps links well to Grant, and Grant's presentation was really fabulous. I'm really glad to, that someone's doing that kind of structured, rigorous work. But what was clear from the work we did at SOAS was this, that, uh, and the, the people that I spoke to had really similar experiences to the people, that much larger group that Grant spoke to, people that didn't realise or didn't think that they had any rights, people who didn't think that they could ask for adjustments, to the way that teaching was done or the way that their marks were assessed. 
um, people perhaps who had never been in a group with fellow stammerers, who actually hadn't thought about the extent to which their, um, their, um, their difficulties were, were constructed by the university context, who thought that stammering was an individual problem, was their problem, and almost was their fault. So, I, you know, so in that context, it becomes very difficult or it, it, it wasn't clear to them that they should be accessing um, uh, the disability support services. And again, very, most people in that focus group did not regard themselves as having a disability. So that label didn't connect with them. Um, so we have to find ways that people who stammer um, realize that they have options, they have things that you know, they can ask for and things that can be done that will help them in their learning journey. Um, and that means educating staff, educating academic staff and educating professional um, services staff around the issue so that it's easier for people to think through um, you know, what, what to do if they're approached by someone who stammers. And Grant talked about this really well. Um, more generally, what students said was that the um, lectures and the seminars that were most positive for them were the ones where the lecturers cr created a positive environment right from the start, not just for them, but for everybody. An environment in which people felt they could ask questions, they could show they didn't understand things, they could talk about the problems. And there was something there, and it's really hard to, you know, I've, I've written, create an accepting environment, and that really doesn't quite get to it. But that environment where it's okay to have different learning styles, where it's okay to say you're struggling with things, that was something that students said really helped them. The lecturers that did that made, meant things were much more positive. Um, so just to kind of, um, to sort of start to pull these pieces out, um, we talked about large lectures. Um, and some of the things that really concerned students that stammered was the practice of calling out in large lectures. So picking on someone and, and asking them a question, and which is, can be quite commonplace. And that, um, that feeling being so worrying for some people that they wouldn't come to a lecture. They wouldn't come to a lecture for lecturers that did that. And, um, but conversely, on the other hand, feeling that they couldn't contribute to the questions in a lecture either. So, you know, it was the usual suspects that always asked questions in those large lectures and that people felt they couldn't do it. But actually, we, you know, there were lots of uh, um, ideas that people had about how that could be remedied. And in fact, we saw one of those in um, Lindsay's presentation earlier, the, the, the use of new technology to ask questions. Um, we use Slido, there's also Padlet. These are all free bits of software that are really accessible that can create a more um, open environment. Because it wasn't just people, or it isn't just people who stammer that don't like to ask questions in like, large lectures. Lots of people find that intimidating. And so we have ways that we can overcome that. Um, in group or tutorial um, settings, um, I wonder if it's similar to, in a way to what Claire was saying about, you know, tame your chair or talk to your chair. You know, but um, what students said is it's really important that lecturers chair those interactions, those interactions that lecturers set acceptable standards of behaviour. You know, um, people were worried about being teased, were worried about negative comments, um, and also feeling that they didn't get a chance to speak. That, it, um, that you know, they might end up self-silencing um, because they didn't want to be teased or to have negative comments. Um, and I guess to make space for different people to, you know, for people to speak if they wanted to. Um, so it was this allowing self-differentiated approaches. On the one hand, people said, look, you know, I really don't like it if, they go, if we go around the room and I feel I've got to speak. On, but on the other hand, Sometimes I might like a chance to speak. And so it's about that ability for a student to say to a lecturer, you know, I'd really like to make a contribution on this. Um, you know, I might need more time to get started. Um, you know, but a negotiated approach, a lecturer that's open to that approach. Um, and then finally, in presentations and assessments, a really crucial one was about removing fluency from assessment criteria. 
And actually, if you look at assessment criteria, actually very often formal assessment criteria never have the word fluency in them because unless you're actually doing a program that requires, you know, that's all about you becoming fluent, not hesitating, why should fluency be in there? But we all know, I've seen it, that in many other, in real life, when people are assessing presentations, you know, fluency, confidence, poise, all of those things affect your final mark. And I think what we need to do is we, you know, we need to give guidance to people that are using assessed presentations to think about what is it you're looking for in that presentation? Is it wonderful fluency of speech or is it knowledge of a particular subject? Is it the ability to group ideas? Or, and really challenging it when we see th those sorts of assessments. Um, but also a whole set of issues around changing the amount of time someone has, the approach to assess presentations. And we've talked about those, you know, doing assess presentations to a different audience, having a different amount of time, being able to do them in a different format. Lots of really innovative ideas. And actually ideas that are well recognised and understood. You go to the BSA website. It's a fabulous list of ways that assessed oral presentations can be adjusted. Um, So I think what I wanted to end with was that, you know, in this context of these, you know, quite radical pedagogical changes, some of them in the name of greater inclusion, but, you know, changes that can often lead to new sites of disadvantage for people who stammer. And by the way, for other people that, you know, don't, that have communication disorders or social anxiety that don't, um, you know, that, you know, don't benefit from being assessed um, through verbal work, um, or don't benefit from being assessed through group work, that, you know, we really need to challenge how we think of inclusion. And perhaps it goes, abs it goes back to what Grant was talking about. You know, what's our view of disability? What are the disabilities that we're um, adjusting for in university? Um, and how do we do that? And I think that the message that came out from those focus groups and, those, and that work with academics and people that led in learning and teaching was something about flexibility. And that's a real challenge to all of us, because, especially in universities. You know, you have these set approaches. It's, and you know, right at the start of the year, you put it up on the website and you say, you know, my lectures will be you know, 60 minutes long and the tutorials will be you know, 55 minutes and, and they'll be assessed in a certain way. But actually, some of this is about having that flexibility built in right from the start. Um, but also having that more accepting environment. And this is where I, you know, I, you know, I, add with, I end with this statement about an inclusive environment for people who stammer being good for all learners. I've been talking about the fact that a range of the moves towards inclusion that we've just seen them, that we've just seen earlier, might not be good for people who stammer because they create um, new forms of assessment that can be difficult for someone um, with a speech impairment. Um, that, however, if we move towards that more flexible environment where we are allowing people to verbalise far more how, you know, what works for them, how they can best learn, when we have more discussion about actually what are we trying to assess in that presentation, what are the skills we want to see, genuinely that will be good for a range of, for, for all learners. That environment will be a, a more positive one. So that's what I wanted to end with. Um, so thank you very much. And if there are any questions, thank you. Hi. Um, I just thought that I would, um, I would mention that uh, stammering can also indirectly affect non-verbal assessments because because they feel that they are that they are unable to 
talk to and express their ideas to other students and so um so something that could be a result of that is that is that their that um that their ideas aren't a very um very clear um in their r r writing and and that's because people don't get the opportunity to talk things out with fellow students or yeah i can and i think we'd all recognize that that the more we kind of talk about an idea the sharper it becomes and for example a good thing is and it's kind of linking to something that you know claire was talking about but you know as you progress in academia so you know as you become a, a you know master student a phd student routinely what people do to refine their argument is to go and to present at seminars and I mean, I'm speaking very fluently now, but I had a stammer that made me feel when I was in my 30s anyway, that I really couldn't do that. And in fact, it was really difficult to go to seminars um, and to share those ideas and then to get then to refine them. So you're right. It's a, that lack of, um, you know, that sort of feeling that you can't engage in that way yeah, can have more pervasive effects. I guess the challenge is what's the solution for that? Is, it, is there a way you can share material on kind of um, other kinds of sites or in other kinds of ways and get feedback on it? And I just wonder whether that's something that you've been able, whether that's something that you know, you've seen or thought about. Um, um, well, so something that I thought, um, um, something that c could maybe start um, at, the undergraduate level um, is if the lecturers um, can maybe ask um, or maybe ask the students um, um, not um, simply um, who wants to ask a question but also ask um, who wants to ask a c question, but is too is too afraid to um, to to put their hand up. So actually things like Slido or you know, Padlet, those other techniques would be really good as well, even in smaller settings, perhaps. No, thank you. Um, hi, I was wondering, um, has um, SOAS implemented any of the um, tips and ideas you thought of in your presentation. And then also one other thing, because I'm a student at King's, and so and so I stammer also. Mm -hmm. And and basically one of the really good things that and basically only and basically only one of my modules has put into place is that yes, and um, so basically we do have a group a group presentation, but then also we are each and basically required to um, sort of like um, and basically write up our ideas in a blog, which is actually really, really useful because it also counts for participation. Mm. And so that is, um, yeah, so it's another way of assessing um, participation, which I thought really, really useful. Mm. But then that only happened in my third year. And yeah, <laughs> but at least it's a positive change. Mm. So. So in terms of what we've done at SOAS, we, so we are trying to encourage the use of Padlet. So we use Padlet usually, and we're trying to encourage that in large lectures, and very specifically trying to encourage it in the situation of that lecture point out. And that depends a lot on the style of the lecturer, but you know, that thing about putting someone on the spot and asking them a question. Um, the other thing is the um, criteria of fluency in a SES presentation. And actually where I'm having a really interesting discussion and there's still a lot of discussion to have, is around um, language acquisition and the extent to which fluency 
gets marked positively in um, oral tests of language acquisition. And it's a really interesting one. And I think we have to push heavily. If someone is learning Japanese, for example, there are people who are Japanese who stammer and they speak fluent Japanese. So it's not about fluency, it's about the ability to convey ideas in a language. But there's a real struggle. And, I'd l and I know there are colleagues in the audience who, who specialise on this area. And I think it's one we have to really take on board. And we have to really, um, you know, we have to keep pushing these boundaries. So, yeah, I'm, so the issue of fluency is one that's, or as being um, something in a test presentation is a, is a big issue and I'm trying to work on it. And so if others are interested in that, I'm really keen to hear from you, but particularly in foreign languages. Lovely. Well, otherwise, um, oh, there's one, there's one here. Um, I would I would support the idea of um, different style and different approaches, and um, it was interesting to hear Claire saying that um, that students score a, a lower score for disfluent presentations compared to a fluent presentation, and I I had a lecturer in, in my university days who had quite a severe stammer. Um, but he was fantastic, and um, he just went the extra mile to make the presentation more more impactful, more interesting, uh, more useful, and and more inclusive. And if he was scored, he'd he'd score a lot higher than all the other fluent presenters. Um, and I think it's it's just an example of an acquired strength of people who stammer. Um, there's enormous opportunity to stand out as, as a person who stammers um, by being almost forced, if you like, to um, be slightly different and have a different approach. So, so I think that's a really good point. And I have known other lecturers that have stammered, and often that means that people work even harder on their presentations. The negative of that is that people often do a lot more work. I used to look at my colleagues who would just roll out for a lecture when I used to over-prepare lectures. I think that's a really common story that I hear among lecturers that stammer, that, you know, I'd over-prepare, make sure I'd really got it. And, but, you know, um, but that was positive for my students because I would think a lot about what I wanted them to take away. I th and I think, you know, um, that kind of focus is good. But I'd also say there's something about, you know, the fact that we know that stutter-filled speech can elicit certain um, feelings in non-stammerers and possibly in stammerers as well. I just don't know if that research has been done. But I think for me, for self-disclosure self was really important. That I said, I have a stammer, I will get stuck, it's going to be fine. That's something that I would commonly say at the start of anything. Because I think if, you know, if we can change what the norm is, you know, that good, good speaking doesn't have to be lack of, you know, absence of hesitation. And if, if, so, you know, I wonder how much we can do that bit that, that you know, cl you know cl Claire talked about that campaigning work. But I think if we can, you know, really challenge the, um, you know, the championing of fluency and, and say there are, there are other ways of speaking, that would be, that's a really positive thing. And I think we can um, sometimes do that with students who, can, who are perhaps hearing someone that stammers and who is open about stammering for the first time in university. And so we can change some of those norms. Um, but maybe that's wishful thinking. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So we're now into the final stretch of the day, so we're going to have a quick break now. Um, if we could try and get back here for a uh, quarter to four, please, that would be great. Thank you very much.
One, two, two, two. Two, two.
We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Can I ask you to take your seats, please? So we're, we're, we're going to start now. Um, our next presentation is from Claire Norman, and it's entitled Universities Stuck in Their Ways. Claire. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon as well to everyone who is watching this on live stream. Um, my name's Claire Norman, and this is my presentation for the day. It's uh, Universities Stuck in Their Ways. So just to talk you through what I will be uh, discussing in the next half an hour, um, I'll be talking about who I am, which would be helpful for most of you who don't know me, um, what stuck actually is. Um, I'll go through some um, statistics for you just to really get you in the Saturday mood. Um, I will also go through the uh, university members of, of stuck. And I'll talk you through the uh, stuck process too. So we'll go through the uh, focus group and the seminar su summaries that I have been um, holding over the last few years. And we'll talk about the future aims of stuck. And I'll finish on any easy questions that you guys may may have to ask. So who am I? <laughs> um, I I'm Claire. Um, I have stammered since the age of five, so that's uh, 22 years now. Um, and just to give you a bit of background, so um, I read uh, French studies at the University of Warwick from 2010 to 2014, and I recently completed a uh, distance learning master's in counter fraud and counter corruption studies. Um, I am on, I'm a, a Maguire program graduate, other speech therapy courses are available, I have to say that, um, and that was in uh, 2017, and I was um, part of the uh, BBC Two documentary The Secret Helpers, which was broadcast in March last year. After I graduated, I landed a job with Amazon as a bilingual fraud investigations specialist, and now I currently work at CIFAS, which is the UK's leading fraud prevention organisation, as an intelligence analyst. So what is stuck? As you hopefully know by now, as I've put it on all social media and on every single bit of paper that you guys have today, um, stuck stands for the Stammerers Through University Consultancy. Originally, it stood for Stammerers Through University Campaign, but I felt like I was doing more than campaigning. I'm trying to uh, advise people. I'm trying to introduce change. I founded Stuck in 2014 during my final year of my French degree, um, and uh, it, it basically started because I, um, I had my final year French oral, um, which was worth a very large proportion of my overall uh, degree mark. So I went to my um, university's disability services and said, I have a stammer, I've got this presentation, can you please help? And they said, just breathe. Um, which, as we know, is very unhelpful advice. And they also said, um, have you considered picturing your examiners naked? Yes, and my stammer is gone. So, um, as, as you can tell, I wasn't happy with this advice at all. And that got me thinking, how many other people with n not only a stammer, but also other invisible disabilities are being given really rubbish advice s such as that? 
And I thought, well, no one else is going to do anything about this, so I better do it. So I, I set up Stuck um, on the back of that. And Stuck is free. It's completely and utterly free. So Ian mentioned earlier, why aren't all universities um, signing up to Stuck? Um, I wish they would to be honest, and they're not, which is a real, real shame. Um, in the last five years, I've managed to get 16 universities on board, and I'll talk through them later. Um, but I've, I've had um, emails back from universities saying that they, they can't join Stuck because they don't have any stammerers at their university. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and other things such as resources, and they don't have any staff to... to um, cover the stuck relationship um, but it's just me all I need is one room on their campus and I will do the rest of the work so it really is very little time and work on your part unless you're Deborah and offer to help with this conference <laughs> um, so yeah I get lots of reasons why uh, universities can't join stuck but I, I do keep pushing back um, I often get um, messages from university students saying hi is my university part of stuck and when I say no they are really upset by it because they they feel like their university isn't supporting them in the ways that they should and that's something that I really think we need to change so Stuck at the moment is um, a service provided to universities in the, the UK um, on the basis that I fund it myself and I can't afford to go abroad. So um, I've been asked to help um, universities in Italy and as much as I'd love a holiday, I can't fund it. So for now, I'll be staying in, th in the UK, um, but hopefully if it spreads, then hopefully it'll be a wider wider scope and most importantly I think is stuck supports not only students but also the staff and the personnel so I'm not missing anyone out at all um, you'll find that um, on the internet um, if you look at um, help pages for people who stammer they will specifically target a certain group um, and even though this is what I'm doing here, I think I'm the only person who is targeting everyone within a, a university sphere as opposed to just students or just staff. I'm trying to make sure that everyone is being supported in the ways that they should. So for those of you who like numbers, I'm going to put some, some statistics up here for you. So... According to 2017 data, um, the number of undergraduate and postgraduate students was 2.3 million. Academic staff was just over 200,000. And non-academic staff is, uh, sorry, was 212,000. So, according to my calculations, um, that is 2.7 million people who are involved in university life in the UK, which is incredible, isn't it? That's a huge, huge number. And if we divide that by the common um, statistic that 1% of the adult population stammers, this means that Stuck has the potential outreach of just over 27,000 people. And if you think that only 16 universities have signed up to Stuck out of 140 universities in the UK, that shows either how, how little resource there is, but also how much universities need to sit up and pay attention and make sure that their students and staff are being supported in the ways that they can. So... Here is a list of my favourite universities in the country. Um, we do have a couple more universities in the pipeline who are really close to joining, which is fantastic. So, and these are also in order that they join. So starting from uh, Newcastle and UCL in 2014, going to uh, the University of Essex last year. So these universities were very, very keen to join Stuck. They're very proactive in their approach as well. Um, some universities are, all, are already very um, forward-thinking 
in their ways to support people who stammer, and others aren't so much. I'll, I'll just say that much. Um, so some already have many support um, mechanisms in place, um, and others not so much. So it isn't it isn't about um, c competing and trying to be the best university from a stuck perspective, but it's more about sharing best practice and seeing if one university is using something that works, why not replicate it elsewhere? You know, so it's 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 a very simple way to see what works in other universities and if that can be adapted to suit another university's framework. So because I, whoops, hello, it's gone the wrong way. So hopefully this will start playing in a minute. No. Oh, okay. So I, I tend to focus more on animations than the actual slide content. So this was going to be a map of where, where the, you know, the stuck members are, but it's not loading. So if you just picture a very wide range of dots, <laughs> that, will, that will show where all of the stuck members are. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the, um, the whole stuck process then is I pester a university like MAD by email and ask them to join and outline the ways in which um, their, the university can support those people who, who stammer. After they join, I then hold a fo fo focus group um, on, on campus um, to discuss um, with people who stammer there, people who work in the disability services there, um, student support, mental health, um, basically anyone who is interested in stammering, they can come along. And we, we want to address what the university is and isn't doing for them. That's the, that's the key. So it's letting people speak in a non-judgmental environment to make sure that their voices are heard as a group rather than individually. And following that, I take those um, notes that people have made and I host a se seminar, which is more um, where the people who are able to make changes and put things into action meet. And I lay out the findings to them and I say, look, this is what your students and staff are wanting you to do. And this is what your staff and students are saying you're not doing enough of to allow me to reach my full potential. And it's from that that we start to create a plan of action and put it into practice. So I'm just going to uh, briefly cover um, some of the summaries of the um, focus groups that I've been holding over the last few years. So lack of awareness. This one's pretty obvious. We've all heard it before. Um, it's more people don't know what help is available to them. So many, many students have said to me that they, they don't know how to ask for help. They don't know who to go to. They don't necessarily consider their stammer to be a disability. So why would they go to disability services? So th there's obviously there's a, a very fine line as to whether we consider a stammer to be a disability or not, but that depends on the individual's needs. And also, there's a lack of awareness, not, not only in um, the academic space, but also um, outside of the university sphere. So when I applied to uh, D DSA at, at the start of my, my final year, and I said, I have a stammer, I would like some resources to help me. Um, firstly, I didn't stammer at all in that meeting, so I don't think they believed me that I actually stammered. Um, but they, they um, offered me a free laptop and a free printer. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'll take those, but that's not going to help me. <laughs> so again, I think it's about raising awareness and getting people to understand what having a stammer is, how it manifests itself, and how that would affect someone in an academic setting in particular. 
Um, incorrect information and acting on myths, this is one that really makes me angry because, for example, as we've all heard, many people, when they see someone who stammers, will tell them to take their time, to relax, to not worry, etc., which are all things that we would say to someone with anxiety, f for example. So many people think that stammering is linked to anxiety. One could cause, the stammer could cause anxiety, sure, but that doesn't mean that you get to treat them in the same way. So telling someone to um, be relaxed is not going to help someone, even if it helps someone who has Anxiety, you can't copy and paste those methods onto someone else because just, just because they, ha they have a stammer. Also, um, myths such as people who stammer can't um, enter a um, job role where they need to speak. As you can see t today, we have completely busted that myth, 100%. But people often believe, incorrectly so, that people who stammer are less intelligent than others and that they're more nervous it's possible that we're more nervous because we have a stammer but it doesn't mean that we are naturally nervous as people um mental health it's obviously a very commonly known fact that stammering and mental health are very much linked um not only on the anxiety scale in terms of general anxiety and also social anxiety but also depression um, and this could also lead to more serious consequences um, and one thing i'm calling for is for uh, m mental health support services at universities and the disability support to try and work together because they're they're just not communicating with each other and it, it must be understood that even if it doesn't affect some people, others will be affected by their disability in terms of their mental health. But why aren't they working together? Interviews. So not only interviews for students in terms of getting a graduate job, but also staff. Staff who want to try and get promoted to go up to the next level, who feel like they can't because of the pressures that they will need to be talking for the majority of their job. So it's about trying to raise the awareness of that and to not let your stammer get in the way of landing your dream job. Assessment methods. So some universities have set assessment methods for their modules whereas others offer a bit more fle flexibility. For example, at Warwick, um, for, for the course that I did, I was able to choose between exam, uh, coursework, or half and half, but I know that some universities have very strict ways in which certain modules are marked. So if you have a, a, a module that someone really wants to study, but they have a stammer, and the only way to assess that is by an oral presentation, are they going to choose it? Some might, which is great, but others might be too scared to. And that's, that could be something that they really, really want to study. So are we pr prohibiting some students from studying what they really want to because they're worried that they won't do well because they're being assessed on their fluency or their communication skills? And something that we all know, and it's something that the British Stammering Association has been saying for a long time now, is that it's what you say, not how you say it. So why are we marking people on how eloquently they talk, on how fluently they talk? That, that doesn't matter. It's what we say that matters. And if it takes me twice as long, does that matter? Really? In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. 
and also for non academic staff who may not see people in, in an academic setting. So I have one example where a um, student came up to me in a uh, stuck focus group and said that when they um, forgot their gym pass to enter, enter the campus gym, they had to say the, their name to the um, person on the, the reception desk. And they started to stammer, as most of us will stammer on our names. Um, and the um, person on, on the desk um, refused to let them in because they thought that they were lying because they couldn't say their name. So let's just think about that. You're being accused of lying because you are unable to speak eloquently. How demoralizing and rude is that? And just because that person might not know something about stammering, it could really shatter the confidence of that person who was just trying to get their name out. So it's not only teaching the academic staff, it's also about trying to make sure that everyone is armed with the tools and the knowledge that they are able to just wait and let people who stammer talk, not interrupt them, not uh, accuse them of being uh, uh, liars or anything like that. So on to the seminar uh, summaries. So some things that we have put into place um, are campus-wide events to raise the awareness of stammering, um, visible text to advertise support. So my, my theory is that if a university openly advertises that they will offer support to people who stammer, more people will disclose because they are openly saying we are able to help people who stammer so if you come and tell us that you have one, we are able to help. But equally, it's down to the student or the staff member who wants the support to go and ask for that help. So it, it needs action from both parties. If one, if one person is doing all of the work and the other isn't reciprocating that, it isn't going to work. So it needs both parties to be equally active. For mentoring, the University of York now has a, a mentoring scheme where um, students and staff who stammer will have a mentor. Not necessarily to help them with th their work, but it's just someone to help them, to give them support and to give them someone to, to talk to. So as Ian mentioned earlier in his presentation with his um, mentoring scheme, it really works. And that person doesn't necessarily have to, to have a stammer th themselves, but just having someone who understands and won't interrupt you and will just listen can make such a massive difference. Improved inclusion and diversity training is something that I would really like to see rolled out. Um, and I think that this is really key because many, many students aren't aware that if their staff are not educated in the facts about stammering, they may discriminate, but not, not on purpose, but they may not know that they're actually hurting that, that, that person's feelings. So if we, in, if we change the, the way that students are, sorry, that staff are trained, um, just to let them know how a stammer might manifest itself, we could make big differences and that might help the student feel more at ease when they're studying as well. So it's all about making people feel comfortable and not feeling alienated because of their stammer. And reasonable assessment adjustments. So I'm not saying that all universities should offer options where the student doesn't have to talk full stop, but just being flexible with the ways that students can be marked 
Should everything be based on oral presentations? I don't think that's hugely necessary. But again, if you have a, a module that is assessed purely by vocal um, par participation, if someone who has a stammer feels that they aren't able to choose that module, that is a flaw in the university's framework. That is an absolute flaw. If we are stopping our students from choosing the modules they really want to do, from studying the topics they really want to specialise in, isn't that what university's for? Something to bear in mind. So future aims for Stuck is to continue to grow the member base. We've got 16. I've only got 134 to go. Um, obtain permanent funding. So I fund Stuck myself. Um, so to have, to have some money, wouldn't we all like money? It would be really, really helpful to work with the National Union of Students. So I, I, I really want to be able to get a, a wider outreach. And I feel that through the, the National Union of Students would be really a, a key way to do that. Um, I also want to um, collaborate closely with charities and organisations um, who work for um, people who stammer. So, for example, the British Stammering Association, the Employers Stammering Network, etc. Um, to host events focusing on stammering and, and university life, such as this one. Not only because I think it's really useful for people to learn more about um, how to support students and staff who stammer in a university setting, but also, without meaning to be hyperbolic, these conferences, I truly believe, have the potential to change people's lives. If people are able to take back to their e university some ways that they could help students, that has the, the potential to, to, to really change someone's life. Um, to recruit volunteers, um, it's just me. Um, and I, I run stuck on my own outside of a full-time job. So most of my annual leave is used up <laughs> to travel all over the country to talk to people. So if anyone wants to do that for me, come and let me know. Um, to discuss disability disclosure with um, UCAS. Um, and I will probably talk about that in the um, Q&A session next. And of course, to uh, develop and grow my website as well. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Does anyone have any questions for me? Michael is on hand. Hi Claire, I'm Jenny. Hiya. I'm a disability advisor at the University of Northampton. Oh yeah. It was really interesting listening about what, what you do and how you work with universities. Thank you. I was just curious, mm. how do you engage with universities that don't have um, students with stammers that have, um, in touch with them? So then you wouldn't be able to do a, a focus group at you know at the beginning. Yep. So um, we've only had um, a couple of universities who. Um, who have uh, joined Stuck, who don't have students who stammer, they have um, staff who stammer. So it's more about um, trying to reach out to anyone who, who does stammer, but, um, but also it's, even, even if it isn't helping anyone who is studying there at that particular moment in time, doesn't mean that they're not going to have people who stammer joining that university in the future. So it doesn't matter, really, if a university doesn't have any stammerers um, there, because that's just only f f f for 12 months. And they may find that in, in the... Uh, the uh, in the autumn, um, that they have loads coming. So it's it's about preparing people for the best that they can. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we've got time for just these two, and then we'll have to. Sorry, right in the 
<laughs> Hiya. Hello. Um, so, so you've got like kind of sixteen um, kind of universities involved. Um, yep. However, I notice um, that like neither of the ones that you went to are on the list. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> So how did you decide like which universities like to approach um and which ones um that were going to like respond best um like to your message and what you were trying to do? Sure. So um I emailed every university going. It took me a whole weekend and it used up a lot of my internet. Um <laughs> so I I did contact every university um and I just basically explain what I want to do um, and how I can help. Um, and then it's just down to, to them, really. There's there's only so much that I can do. As I was saying earlier, with a two-way participation, I need the university to actively want to do this. Otherwise, it just isn't going to work. Thank you. Just one more question. Hello, Claire. Hello. Um, my name's Moira. I'm um, a careers advisor working in a, a, a further education college, mm. Student 16 Plus. Yep. Um, I know it's only you at the moment doing this. Um, I work with students, some who had stammers, and um, help prepare them for interviews and going into employment or yep. apprenticeships. Um, you were talking about raising the awareness of stammering, and I know that you know it's difficult for you being on your own doing this um, with universities. But would you or be prepared, say, in the future, to do some kind of um, CPT train training for staff in FE colleges? Would that be an option where you could um, raise the awareness in that sense? I don't. Yeah, um, that would be brilliant. Um seeing as this last year I've managed to balance stuck a full-time job and a part-time master's, I don't see why not. But I'm really worn out all of the time, so I might have to wait for a bit, I think. Yeah, <laughs> um, we, we're linked because there's been lots of area, area reviews of colleges, and now we're linked with um, Rittle University College yep. in um, Essex. Um, so there's a kind of like joint thing there. I don't know if they're how many students they've got, Stammer, but I was just thinking it might be some it might be a way of starting at the bottom and absolutely working up. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much. Okay, I am running slightly over, which is um, embarrassing as it's my conference. So um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. So we're on to our uh, final session of the day, which is the panel Q&A. So please can I bring onto the stage uh, Chris Deuce, Beulah Samuel Obu, Mandy Taylor, Rory Sheridan, and our moderator for the day, Billy Stevens. Uh, my name is Billy Stevens. Um, I'll start with a bit of background on myself. Um, I'm an experienced master of ceremonies and uh, stand-up comedian. I'm going to be the panel moderator today, um, so I'll be taking your questions and posing them to the panel. Uh, any questions, please feel free to pose the questions to the, uh, the whole panel or an individual. Um, if it's for a specific individual, then uh, please let me know uh, so I can uh, point it in the right way. So uh, let's go through the, uh, the panel now. Um, at the far end, we have Rory Sheridan. Um, Rory is a um, socially engaged practitioner and activist whose work engages with the relationship between um, artistic practice and um, representing um, neurodiverse communities. Um, recently graduated from the University of Arts London with a BA Honours in Photography. Uh, next along, we have Mandy, um, Mandy Taylor, who is vice chair of the British Stammerers Association, um, has a financial role in, integrated, in an integrated marketing agency, 
Both Mandy and her partner um, suffer from a stammer, as well as uh, three of four of, uh, sorry, three of their four children. Uh, next along we have Beulah, uh, Beulah Samuel Obu. Uh, Beulah studies here at SOAS for a uh, degree in English um, and has recently been elected as the co-disabled students and carers officer um, for the SOAS Student Union. Moving along we have uh, Chris Deuce. Um, Chris is a staff tutor at the Open University, uh, a stand-up comedian as well. Um, Chris has also been a, a tutor on a postgraduate education module um, and regularly facilitates professional development with events for tutors. Um, finally, nearest me is Claire, who you've uh, just seen. Um, Claire is founder of, uh, founder of Stuck, um, now advises 16 member universities across the UK. Um, Prevent and uh, recently presented um, Stuck's work in Japan, um, which was, uh, I'm sure, quite a fun trip. Mm -hmm. Lovely. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's start off by going to the audience. Um, please um, raise your hand if you have a question. Okie dokie, let's start with Slido then. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the, uh, the Slido questions are, um, will be ranked by the most amount of likes. So if you would like a question um, to be asked, you can put it on Slido, or you can um, vote for a, a question that's already been posed. Uh, we'll start with the pop, uh, top one. Um, do you have any thoughts on how a person without a stammer can support and accommodate people with a stammer, particularly within HE and the workplace? Um, would anyone like to volunteer for that one? Um, I can have a go. Yeah, I please, guess. Chris. Uh, um, I think, it, I mean, isn't it true to say that everybody is different? Uh, and there was, has been a, uh, a few people who have mentioned the uh, topic of acceptance, and that was uh, something that I did uh, want to, to highlight and emphasise. Because everyone who, who has a stammer is, uh, is, is different, and that... Uh, difference can be in acceptance and how they do personally feel about it as a subject. Um, that my, under, um, my own understanding of that is acceptance is very much a process uh, and that, uh, in my own, own experience it has uh, two aspects uh, of it. A intellectual concept of acceptance uh, which is very different from the actual emotional perspective of acceptance. So it's easy to say, oh yes, uh, you should accept, but it's harder to actually take that in and live it on a day-to-day -day basis. So everyone is different. So I would, my comment about, uh, in response to that question, is, is, is how can someone who hasn't got a stammer support someone who has got a stammer, is ask them. Ask them what, what would you like Kim's me to do, but also, uh, there's uh, uh, an opportunity there to actually tell them. So I want you to behave to me in these particular ways. I, I do not want you to complete my sentences. Uh, I, I want some help under these uh, situations. Uh, um, it's all about having a conversation and opening up uh, a dialogue. Fantastic. Would anyone like to add anything to that? Um. Well, I just um, create, um, started a workshop called Disabled Students Empowerment, Allyship and Ableism. And we were talking about um, institutional and barriers being reinforced in university. And I found a number one um, complaint about, um, about what reinforced um, lots of the barriers in universities, how a lot of students are not aware about um, stammering and like what's of the causes and what does it feel like to actually have a stammer. And a lot of people in the workshop didn't actually have any disability, just wanted to understand because either had a friend or family member that wanted to know like how can we tackle so how can you help you how, how you should help us help you in that in, in that area so i so we all took all the people who had disabilities kind of talked to and understand what it was like to have it and like what type of help we actually need it like sometimes our help is not we don't actually want you to actually help us directly but simply understand or like sometimes not simply just um be the speak for us but speak with us and that's such Mm. Absolutely, great points by uh, by uh, Bula and Chris there. Um, I'd, I'd like to add as well um, about 
four years ago I had met Claire um, and we've been close friends since. Um, and up until that point, I didn't really have, I was quite ignorant about stammering. Um, but it was, it was uh, quite easy. Claire's obviously a um, uh, strong person, so she was quite forthright with what she did want help with, what she didn't. Um, so it might be an occasion where I'd order the food in a restaurant for us both, um, and Claire might ask me to do that. There might be other occasions where Claire would ask me to not do certain things. Um, so I think it's just about communicating uh, with each other, um, and that's the best way to get awareness of how to support out there as well. Um, just my opinion, obviously, I'm not the most qualified person. Um, <laughs> so uh, moving on to the next question now. Um, uh, is the stammering, sorry, is the stammering area too formal? Um, is there benefit, i.e., getting people to come forward to, um, sorry, getting people to come forward by making it fun? Um, if so, how can we do this? Um, Claire, would you like to start off with this question? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of hmm, getting people to come forward and like making it fun. Naheem, you've really, really stumped me there. I, <laughs> when you say by making it fun, do you mean in terms of making activities that people who stammer would normally struggle with more fun? Or I don't think you should ask me my idea of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't have fun. <laughs> Absolutely. I think um, I think it would be down to the people who stammer to put forward those suggestions. Um, if if someone who isn't as knowledgeable um, as someone who knows how a stammer might manifest itself, they might end up doing the opposite of what they're trying to, to achieve. So. I think, again, it's down to the person who stammers to be able to um, put forward those ideas, um, which I just think, even though some people might not want to, if they, if they want that change to be made, they need to be the one to say, I really struggle with this task. Is it possible we could adjust it? in this way. Absolutely. Yeah. I shall organize a hiking trip or something next <laughs> well actually if i could just come in there because i do recall many moons ago when i first looked out for um anything to do with stammering and i thought to myself right i'm going to go along to the first bsa conference that i was going to go to and I had this thing in my head that it was going to be all these very serious people discussing stammering. And it was a riot. It was great. <laughs> Quite literally. There was, it was the best thing. There was social <laughs> stuff going on. So it is about going and attending things. And there are lots of them. There is open days that you can attend. There are annual conferences. And in fact, there are um, six members that I'm traveling with with the uh, BSA to Iceland in June. 
and I can say it's not going to be quiet affair. <laughs> I would say it will be quite sociable, and I do think, though, that we need to break those barriers down of it being a very um, serious thing, stammering, seen as this dreadful aff affliction. And how we do that is managing our own language as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about building uh, communities. It sort of links back to what um, Lindsay was presenting earlier about networks. Um, cool. Uh, next question we'll go to. Um, do, do, do. How can we try and encourage more academic staff to attend training sessions? Uh, tends to always be the usual suspects that attend. Um, and that, that question's from Sarah. Um, who from the pan panel would like to volunteer for this? Shall I have a go? Go for it, Chris. Yeah, no, I can try. In my context at the Open University, uh, uh, the tutors are, are actively encouraged to, to um, attend as many as they, they can, can possibly stomach. Uh, um, I think it's a <laughs> carrot and a stick. Uh, and arguably, if they are, are, like, are fun and interesting, then uh, that is a positive draw. Um, and, uh, uh, in, and if there's something in it for them, uh, and why should they go? And if it's fun, great. But uh, perhaps that could be tied in together with, say, for example, an important aspect of their like an annual appraisal to show them that they have actively and positively achieved. Uh, in the Open University, there's a, a push to make uh, the tutors a member of something called the Higher Education Academy. So if they attend certain events, then that's a good tick in the, in the, in the box. Of course, just having a tick in the box isn't... Uh, uh, isn't the same as actually taking on uh, and thoroughly understanding stuff. Uh, but uh, um, I think it, it is really important to actively engage academics because they are, are the people who speak to the students. And, and if I could just um, have a quick anecdote. <coughs> um, I do remember a, a, a range of different instances in my own university career. There was a set of group work, uh, which was quite challenging. And interesting. There was a, a, a tutor who spoke to my then girlfriend, encouraging me to actually attend speech therapy. Uh, and uh, um, I thought that was a, a really interesting approach. Uh, and uh, she said, well, Why don't you go? Uh, but that, 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 that's a whole other story, uh, an acceptance um, hashtag issue. And uh, then uh, there was this other tutor at a university. He was a um, a, a math tutor, and he was absolutely terrible because he spoke um, spoke a bit more to the blackboard than he did to his students, uh, and his proofs about induction were were absolutely baffling. And I had the, the pro I had the the profound misfortune of, of having him uh, as a, a project tutor at the 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 dissertation. I think he's retired now, and I've completely forgotten his name. So, and, uh, and uh, this is being recorded, so I, I think it's all okay. Uh, and um, he said, uh, 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 so I had a project meeting with him, uh, and, and uh, um, he brought up the um, issue of, of my speech, uh, and he said, Chris, I think, uh, I think that Jesus could help you. And I thought. Sorry, uh, do you mean Jesus, uh, a uh, local speech and language therapist? <laughs> but apparently he didn't, uh, uh, because there wasn't someone called Jesus in the local speech and language therapist. Uh, and uh, um, him, him actually mentioning the church was, was kind of completely uh, well-intentioned on his perspective, but uh, profoundly wrong, in my opinion, uh, being a practicing atheist. I think I, I can say that also. Uh, so, an education is really important of the academic staff uh, and that uh, um, is uh, such a, a continuum of, of disabilities and the impairments of which stammering is just uh, one of them and it's important to us uh, and the, the uh, degree of awareness of, of disability related issues um, is increasing and it's a changing and there has to be a continuing uh, continuing a professional development for academic communities. And it's the responsibility of, of the universities. And um, I'll be speaking to Claire. Speaking to Claire, Claire? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll, I'll be trying to speak to some of my colleagues in the OU and I'll uh, try to Thank you very much. implement them because Thank the, you. the OU isn't a member <laughs> and they should be. Yet. <laughs> 
Excellent. Um, can we, uh, does, would anyone else like to uh, add something to that or should we move on to the next question? No. No? Cool. That was quite well summed up by Chris there. Um, <laughs> Cool. So uh, next question uh, is from Lindsay. Um, what do you think is the one action we could all take that would make the most positive difference for staff and students who stammer? Claire. Get them to join stuck, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, next. No, I'm joking. Um, yeah. Um, just join, join stuck, because I can, I can help, I think. Um, and I would say just to, to ask questions. Um, ironically, the way to help people who stammer is to communicate and for them to c c c communicate back. Um, we, we just need to ask questions, keep asking questions and um, just t t t to be there for them as, 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 as soppy as that sounds. Having someone who understands, whether it's a um, personal tutor or a friend or a, a staff member, if they're able to help, that they can change any person's life, really. So just by understanding stammering a bit, I think, would be the best way to change how students and staff... Um, <laughs> who stammer um, to live better lives. Very nice points there. Um, I think this might be quite a good question to pose to everyone on the panel, actually. Just go through and um, not, no rush, but because um, <laughs> we're going to ask everyone. Well done. Try and keep it reasonably <laughs> um, Just go through and each one of you give us um, one thing that you think would make a really positive impact. Um, Chris, would you like to go next? I think in terms of a positive impact uh, uh, for, for, for uh, staff and st students, that, that is a question, isn't it? Uh, um, I think a, um, awareness of, of um, inclusive uh, modular design practice and uh, what that actually means from a student-centred perspective. Uh, and also the understanding that um, inclusion uh, um, it, is something that can positively benefit all students, um, irrespective of not as to if they do have a disability. Absolutely. Uh, Beulah? I think um, staff actively wanting to make sure students have a beneficial experience in, in the classroom. I think I mostly have the most um, positive interactions with my with staff members when they actively ask me, what can I do to make your year better for you? Like, how do you learn best? And those classes I generally do a lot better in because I actively, I actually appreciate that teachers take the time to actually listen to my needs. And I actively want to do well because I'm really appreciative, but the ones who almost like shut me down or almost don't want to listen or just don't actively, they just read my inclusion plan, but no, don't think two seconds about it later. I think that's most important. I think students, staff have to make an active role to make, tell students that they understand, not necessarily understand, but they want to make classroom better for them. And not just, not just for a one, um, but, um, box type of student for every type of student as well. Absolutely. Mandy? Um, I really think we all need to have these conversations as early as possible. We shouldn't wait until we're at absolute crisis point. We should be having these conversations from day one. The fact that we stammer should not be, you know, um, re really shouldn't be any ish ish issue but the fact that most people don't bring it up until there is a problem. So I think really we need to have those conversations much, much earlier on. Absolutely. Rory, you have the short straw, I'm sure, the yeah, other no, answer. No, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, um, um, I think the thing which helped me the most through um, my... Uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, my um, uh, um, my um, uh, my um, my university career was um, probably having a, the like a support of the disability service. So, uh, and I also think it's kind of 
um, uh, uh, um, uh, I think it's very useful for for her staff to also disclose um, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, to the disability service or some some other means of um, of. Uh, supported because um, um, uh, um, uh, it was um, uh, very useful for me to have an individual um, uh, um, um, uh, um, 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 and uh, individual support agreements which was actually circulated to all of the tutors and all of the uh, staff I was coming into contact with so um, yeah. yeah excellent some similar themes there around um, communication um, support and um, and also sorry <laughs> communication support and uh, being timely in in how uh, that support is delivered, also. Um, we've let's only got Benny. Sorry, we've only got time for one more question. Okie dokie. Uh, are there any questions from the room? <laughs> Lady in the green jacket. Um, so just following on from what you guys said, I think everything you just said was really accessible, and to a point, like quite common knowledge, and actually, it's stuff I didn't know. So I'm really sorry. Um, what I kind of wanted to say was, it'd be great if that was potentially more public. Like our university does have stuck there. Um, I'm part of the speech and language therapy cohort and actually the stuff you said, I didn't know. So I wonder if there is potentially a way to circulate that information. I know that it probably is out there if you looked, but obviously I know that we're saying that the problem is that there is an unawareness. So I think that potentially if there's a way to circulate what you guys just said, to more than the people in this room would be really helpful in the wider scheme of things. I, d I know that's not really a question, but I, I think that's something that we need to highlight. Absolutely, thank you. For, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Um, uh, do we have time for one more, is that? Uh, a quick one. Okay, one, one quick question then. Um, In what way can the Equality Act 2010... That does not sound like a quick answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try this one. Um, <laughs> why aren't university mental health support and disability support teams collaborating more? Uh, shall I begin? Please, Chris. Uh, I think Ipsons might well depend on the individual institution. The, the institution that I do uh, work with, uh, I think, is uh, very different to others uh, because it's all at a distance. And... Uh, there, there are these. Uh, uh, it is uh, different types of advisors. Uh, there, there's a mental health specialist advisor. There's a visual impairment specialist advisor. There's a, 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 a hearing impairment advisor, and uh, so on. And uh, um, so I think. Uh, um, and the, so, Rory, you mentioned mm. the whole, whole importance of the sharing of information, uh, and uh, that. So each student has got a profile uh, which is uh, negotiated uh, um, with a, a person in the, the university of a set of information that is shared uh, with the tutors. Uh, so th there is a bit of, of uh, collaboration be between the two, but I think it's important to embed uh, the um, expertise uh, not just in in individual people because there's always risks there, but to kind of spread it out. Uh, and uh, there's always risks in institutions that there are sets of silos uh, and uh, mini empires, uh, and I don't think that's helpful. <laughs> so somehow uh, uh, to break those silos. Also there's a concept uh, um, in education, and the Claire will know about this, called the, the communities of a practice. Uh, and uh, uh, we, which are basically groups of people who talk to each other, it's just, just like a posh, posh term. Uh, and uh, there's this concept of a broker, uh, and that is, uh, is there somebody in that group who actually talks to other people? And that's really <laughs> what we do 
do do need academics making things really complicated with posh words. Um, but essentially, it does come back to a thing that I think everyone that's been been here are talking about is a sharing. Uh, and uh, um, but um, in all this, there's the issue of, of personal a personal relationship with the concept of a disability. Uh, I only became, uh, 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 I only did begin to work on acceptance when I was about uh, 35, 36. Obviously that's two years on, um, isn't it? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so everyone addresses it or may address it at a different point to, to different degrees. Uh, and so uh, the extent to which those teams are important and are, are relevant does completely depend on, on people. Again, it's back to the importance of a communication. Yeah, and I do think times are actually changing. People are talking more. Mm. There is more of a um, buzz now around wanting to be more open about mental health. So I think um, many more, um, many more groups are actually s s s seeking help and it's becoming much more acceptable to actually talk about this di di disability, mental health, things l like that. Absolutely. Um, would anyone from the panel like to um, add any further comments? Uh, I would just uh, like to add, add a personal and positive comment and I don't know if uh, um, anyone um, else from here and may relate to it, but uh, uh, thinking about my own personal journey and um, everyone has their own journeys, uh, I think my stammer has actually, has actually given me um, a lot and uh, it has given me like many things to be, be thankful of. It has given me a community, a set of uh, friends uh, and also it has given me opportunities in the institution in which I work so I've been invited to speak in uh, different faculties that have tutored on a, a, a module that does talk about the social model of a disability. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's given me courage. And I think that is a really good thing that um, employers should really treasure in, in us. Because I think we are awesome. And uh, we've got to tell people. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's why we should see stammering as a positive trait, Absolutely. not a negative one. Yeah. Well, a lovely uh, positive note to end on. <laughs> um, everyone, can you please uh, show your appreciation for our panellists? And please, um, please can we also thank um, Billy um, Stevens for um, being our panel moderator for the day. Thank you. 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 Okay, um, so just before the um, closing speeches, um, I have been asked by... A Alistair, if um, he would be able to come and um, give you a, a very quick overview of um, some projects that he is currently working on. So, ladies and gentlemen, Alistair. Hello, uh, I'm Alistair. Now, before I send out, I didn't actually realise I'd be speaking at this until about an hour ago, and I left for this from Glasgow last night at 11 on a coach and haven't, and haven't slept for about 36 hours. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> so I'm a first year student at the University of Glasgow. I'm here now representing the Scottish Stabbing Network, which is the only network in Scotland in Scotland that supports, it supports everyone who stammers. I'm actually the young representative of that, which means that I represent old young people in, in 
Colin to stammer. With this, I, I'm actually this year launching the youth wing of the network, in which I will be touring schools across St Scotland, raising awareness. But I'm also a national officer in uh, the SNP, and this has allowed me to meet some very uh, powerful and Im important uh, people, which I will mention in a minute, because it will hopefully re result in some massive changes. So for International Standing Awareness Day, I made sheets about like my own experiences of, of having a stammer, as well as the mental health issues around that. I spent 20 pounds of my own money and printed off about 300 of them. And at 6 a.m. I went to the uni and left them everywhere. So hopefully some folk read them. Uh, I'm also working with my s p group at the uni to hopefully make Glasgow University the first university in Scotland to work with us with the network and hopefully with stuck as well. But as I said, through the s p I've met some. I've met the first minister herself and the minister for education, and I'm bringing a motion forward right now to the parliament. This motion calls for universal teacher awareness and training for stammering. <laughs> this I brought this motion to SNP Youth in November, the conference there. It was it was passed. And it is looking like it will reach the national conference in October, where there'll be an audience of about 4,000 and news cameras from Sky, ITV, the BBC, etc. If it makes it through that, it'll be taken to the parliament and hopefully passed. And if that is the case, then we will have something we've never had before. A nation that actively has universal teacher support and training for stammers and this is something that i'm sure many of the nations would would learn from and introduce but i do need your help i i, I need the support of experts i need as many retweets as, as many likes so awareness is spread and maybe i'm too young to realize that certain things are impossible but i will find that out by trying as hard as I can. I urge all of you, please don't use your magnificent voices and beautiful stammers as an excuse to live in fear. Please use it as a reason to help me change the world. Thank you very much. So thank you, everyone. This is the end of our day, um, and we hope that you've all enjoyed it, that you've all got what you'd well, wanted to from this day. Um, I know that I've personally found it really useful, really insightful, and I've been excited about the new things that I've heard, um, as much as I've been excited about people that were saying what I wanted to say, but in much better ways. Um, and I think that's been really powerful to hear the fact that actually, when we talked about this issue, we often came up with a set of, um, a set of approaches um, that were agreed, where we all thought, actually, this is a really good idea. And I, so I was going to sort of um, say what I thought, for me, were the three lessons from the day. And I wonder if, um, if they're similar to the ones that other people here had. But I think the first issue is one that um, Chris Boyle put really well in that panel just now, which was um, helping people generally so all of us, helping everybody understand that wide continuum of both visible and invisible disabilities. And so um, having that wider thinking about actually what are impairments, what are disabilities. Um, the second for me was the need then to communicate the specific issues for people that stammer. And just to, and to be doing that in all kinds of ways. But those specific issues, the things that we all recognise, and I think someone asked you know um, made the point in a question actually everything that we've said is so obvious 
but not well known. Um, and the third issue was to get stuck in. So to, to get the stammerers through university, the um, um, consultancy into universities, into the ones that haven't yet um, become members as, as an important way to kind of build up that body of knowledge, to build up that body of awareness. So those were the three issues that I took away from the day and um, are really important for, for how I personally will think about the future. What's our future work here at SOAS? What's the future work we should be doing across the sector? Um, I'm going to hand over to Claire now and I'm, I'm sure Claire will talk about how you can access recordings of the day and you know how we can keep this community of people alive how we can keep talking about this issue but i hope that we'll be here for for events in the future i hope you'll come back to SAS for for other things as well and i hope that this is the beginning of a conversation rather than the end thank you thank you very much deborah um so as i said as i said earlier earlier uh, uh, this morning um there are so there are so many people that I need to thank for helping to make this conference a, a reality. Um, so firstly, I have to thank Deborah for her overwhelming generosity and her dedication and time. Can we please all show appreciation? <laughs> um, and uh, secondly, our um, speakers who have given up their time to produce some really um, fantastic um, presentations for you all today and I, 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 I hope that um, you will all be able to, to take something um, from this and um, to be able to make some um, changes. Um, I also need to thank all, the, all of the um, uh, volunteers who have um, helped today, um, who have given up their time and who have been um, um, ha happy to um, basically have, 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 have me, me um, boss them around basically. So, um, yeah, can we please thank the speakers and also uh, the volunteers. I must also thank all of the um, SOAS staff um, who have um, helped put this t together with the, um, the sound, the, uh, the live streaming, um, the uh, catering and everything. So I'm, uh, I must thank them too and um finally i must thank every one of you for being here today and also to everyone who is um st st streaming this live as well um your um support by being here today um are we, are we, are we, reinforces I shouldn't have put a word that starts with RE should I your support reinforces that the issues that we have discussed today need to be listened to and that changes need to be happen and sorry changes need to be happen changes need to happen um and that and that our voices um need to be heard and we need to uh, uh, truly make a noise about stammering. Um, I hope you all have a safe journey home and thank you very much for coming.